bedroom. A lot of you I know have been here before, but for those of you who haven't been, I want to have you uh, stop afterward, ask any questions you want to of me. Um, also, have a look at the books. They're real special. The uh, Heritage Room is a special service of the Lincoln City Library. It is not a tax-supported service. We depend on our funds through co contributions and grants and other, other um, means of, by which our friends group raises money. That's the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. If anybody's interested in becoming a friend of the Heritage Room, we have some information on the table in the back. We also have a plate back there in case you'd like to give some money to the Heritage Room. Right now we're in the process of raising money for an endowment fund. The um, National Endowment for the Humanities gave, issued a challenge grant to us a couple years ago, and we are to raise $300,000 for every $3 we raise, they will give us a dollar. The endowment fund would be for $400,000, and it would ensure programming continuing. Um, so if you are interested in becoming a friend or have ideas for fundraising projects, let us know. Tonight is um, special. It's the beginning of the third year of readings here in the Heritage Room, and Michael Zangari is our reader tonight. He is a poet and a novelist. He says poetry... Um, published in Rolling Stone, and he's currently working on his third novel. In addition to that, he's a disc jockey, and he also is an employee of Lincoln City Libraries. He's read his works at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, the Zoo Bar, Nebraska Directors Theater, 11th Street Gallery, and for the Union Program Council. Join me and welcome him. If you haven't joined the Zangiri pool, you can do that now. I am uh, a little woozy tonight, so I may pull this a little short. Tonight I'm going to be reading from uh, my current novel. This is uh, the one I hope will do some good things for me. Uh, the novel is called The Community of One, and rather than do a linear sort of thing for you tonight, telling you a story, uh, I thought I'd introduce you to some of the characters by just pulling some random sorts of uh, chapters out, and this spans about 10 years, so if you're uh, confused, there's plenty of reason to be. The church burned down the night of the wedding. By dawn, all that remained when Mary Ann pulled off the interstate into the wooded resort area was a smoking adobe facade, the double doors, the large stained glass porthole above them. She parked the car, packed a small camera bag, and crossed the gravel lot to the path. When she got closer to the ruins, she saw there was a figure silhouetted in the belly of the window. He was settled in a lazy fetal position in the bottom of the zero, one leg propped up on the wall that surrounded him, the other swinging over the side. He was singing softly to himself in a sweet, wavering tenor, a Latin American ballad about the loss of a loved one. It was a song that Murphy Johnson had made them learn one night when he was drunk. Jesse was on verse 113. His hair still curled around his head like pants. Jesse presumed that the voice coming from the edge of the woods was attempting harmony. He squinted in Mary Ann's direction. She was wearing a dress, a sailor suit, new shoes, a Donald Duck hat with tassel. She dropped her bag and began shooting pictures. Her hair was a darker mahogany than he remembered, twisting like brambles down a back road and a braid down her back. It was the third time he had seen her in a dress. And it had been nearly five years since he had seen her at all. I'm sorry I'm late, she said, twisting the telephoto tight on his face and releasing the shutter several times. Jesse had to stand in for her at the ceremony. She was supposed to be Murphy Johnson's best man, or something like that. They never really decided what to call her. 
Sandy had objected to calling her best woman, and her friends and family could see her point of view. As it turned out, it didn't matter anyway. Jesse filled the role fine. Murphy called him his second best man. Jesse said it was the story of his life. Mary Ann kicked off her new shoes. They sailed one after the other into the foliage. She climbed up the wall to the window, settling finally opposite Jesse in the tight circle. She squeezed his side between hers. She leaned close to his face. Jesse was about to speak when Mary Ann grabbed his nose and held it. Jesse would have been perplexed if he hadn't been totally occupied with trying to breathe. Relax, she said. Breathe through your mouth and listen. Our time together here is very short. I don't want to spend a lot of time reminiscing. I am basically the same person you knew three years ago, only logically progressed by several years. I've given a lot of thought. We have a great deal to discuss, and we might as well start now. Jesse nodded as well as he could. Now tell me what happened here. Jesse's story was significantly different than the story she would hear later that night. Not only was his more nasal, he lied. He told her that at the part of the ceremony where Dan asked the congregation if there were any objections to Murphy's union with Sandy, all her proper society friends and family stormed the church like it was the Alamo and burned it to the ground. Mary Ann accepted this at face value. She found out later that the fire had not started until well into the reception. The reception was spread out through the well-manicured woods under paper lanterns. Many of the guests thought that the wafting embers were fireflies, somehow orchestrated to further enchant the already enchanting evening. That is, until the embers lit softly on the roof of the lodge and burst into flames. The party was still relatively young at that point, and the fire people had to fight in the blazes while the festivities raged all around them. At the peak of the fire, one of Murphy's show business friends, a female impersonator by the name of Ruby Slippers, climbed the police sawhorse in a fetching taffeta gown and approached one of the hosemen at the periphery of the fire. She asked him for a light. Ruby and his lover were not exactly having a good time together at the party. The suspicion was that Ruby was trying to make Jarvis jealous. If that was his goal, Ruby succeeded. Now Jarvis is not a small man. He's an Elvis impersonator who specializes in portraying the king in the latter days of his career. Jarvis weighs 300 pounds. He crawled over the police barricade and crashed straight over them to take care of a little business. The fireman, who was just recovering from Ruby, now saw the ghost of Elvis Presley coming at him like a bull. Jarvis tripped and plowed into him. There was a mild riot by the time the whole situation was cooled. Murphy sent Jesse to bail Jarvis out. When he got there, he was doing a really inspired version of Jailhouse Rock at the county jail. Ruby was crying in the corner of the cell. Jarvis said that weddings always affected him like that and helped him to the car. By the time they got back, Murphy and Sandy were gone. Step into my time machine. We'll go back ten years. Her breast fell like warm paraffin onto his chest. It was not unlike the temperature of tears, really. Mary Ann had slipped in shortly after dawn and stood in the doorway of Jesse's bedroom. He was not even sure he was awake. She told him quickly. Ruth was dead, apparently a suicide, an overdose. She unplugged the phone, undressed, and crawled in beside him. After the service, Murphy found him leaning on a tree in the forest. He was breathing into a harmonica. Murphy put his arm around Jesse's shoulder. They went to the dairy freeze to buy popsicles to put in the empty O's of their mouths. When they were sure everyone was gone, they went to the cemetery. 
There was a large stone Gabriel at the gate with a small bird nesting in his horn. Murphy climbed the statue and put his sunglasses on Gabriel's upturned head. They looked for the grave. Murphy came over to Jesse and took him by the arm. He led him to a small pile of dirt near a garden, a quiet spot. They stood with their hands clasped and their heads down for several minutes until Jesse's forehead wrinkled with recognition. They were standing over a pile of mulch. Murphy looked down, realized that he had made a mistake, said it didn't matter. The funeral canopy blew gently in the wind. The workmen were just beginning to break down the tent. Jesse and Murphy sat down on a small knoll overlooking the site and watched. The radio in the truck was on low, the country western station. They folded up the chairs, rolled up the ground cloth, and climbed into the truck. They argued about where to go for lunch. The truck jangled like Tibetan prayer bells as it pulled up the service road. Jesse and Murphy watched the dust drift and finally moved themselves down to the graveside. They had not filled the grave in yet. Evidently, someone else did that later. They stood for a long time, avoiding looking at each other. Then someone stole Jesse's legs. He just plopped down. Murphy sat down beside him, offered him a piece of hard candy. It was Halloween. Jesse dressed up, had no other reason to stay home, decided to go out, followed an impulse into a narrow, dark bar. He wedged himself between the pinball machine and the jukebox and hung there like Christ, a 15th century sentry, fresco sweating blood. He ordered a beer and exhaled heavily to relax. Jesus, right? to the pair of wraparound shades and a fedora. Jesse absently pulls back his hair to reveal the two nubs protruding from his forehead. Pan, he says. The wraparounds and fedora have long blonde hair and a beard. Right, they say. I'm the FBI. They stand back and let Jesse see their totality. They have a rubber trench coat with commie pinko fag sprayed painted in pink on the back. They have sandals. They have a thin bottle of beer with a baby bottle nipple over its mouth. The waitress brings Jesse his beer. It has a baby bottle nipple over the top. Happy Halloween, says the waitress, who is dressed like a waitress. She says that to everybody, says the FBI. There is a lull in the music. Jesse sucks at his bottle. The bar door is propped open with a building brick. The sun is finally going down. The sunset is blinding through the open door. For a second, it strobes in, illuminating the bar, then dies away. The bar seems darker than before. The band begins to tune up. For a moment, the FBI is nimbus and dark-hearted in front of Jesse. Then he moves closer. So, he says, the FBI meets Peter Pan. Just Pan, says Jesse. Truly ironic, says the FBI. Peter Pan, the ambassador of eternal adolescence, meeting the bastion of warped maturity. Historically, this meeting will be regarded as the bridges between the past and the future. The generations will gape in awe. Jesse just wanted to be left alone. I'm going to give Peter Pan the keys to the car. He puts his arm around Jesse and whispers into his ear. America is one of the most linear countries in the world. Jesse attempts to pull away, and the FBI pulls him back. Jesse pulls away. The FBI pulls him back. The secret to long life and happiness, Peter, is self-surveillance. He backs off and nods significantly. He taps his wraparound shades. Self-surveillance. The FBI throws back his arms like he's throwing back a cape. Watch out for pirates, Peter Pan, he cackles, and is gone.
hop back into the time machine. About three years. About three years in the future. Murphy Johnson had gotten a psychic flash. He was convinced that he knew where the gateway to hell was. He picked me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. As far as I was concerned, driving the serpent's tug of back road at 3 in the morning with a man deeply under the influence and a terrified cat loose in the car at high speed was as close to hell as I wanted to get. When we ran out of gas, I was happy. I got out of the car and laid on the hood, looking at the stars and breathing for the first time since we left the city three hours before, shooting stars and UFOs in the Nebraska countryside. Murphy was busy wearing the battery down, attempting to start the car. He finally got out of the car with the cat zipped up to the neck in his jacket. This is it, he said. He jumped the drainage ditch and headed into a field. I was worried about the cat, so I followed his skinny ass into the field. He had both arms raised above his head, two bottles of tequila clinking like castanets in one hand and a tape recorder in the other. He did a rude hula up the row, singing Calypso in that strange falsetto of his. It was the bare bones of a song called A Whale's Lament at Not Being Able to Play Trombone, which appeared on his first album. Only you wouldn't recognize it, it was so slow. You haven't really heard Murphy Johnson until you've experienced that voice of his backed by crickets and silence under a full moon. That's Murphy Johnson. I never forgave the producers of his first three albums. They lost him in the mix, even if they made him a hit. Well, this voice had told him that the entrance to hell would be in a missile silo. I figured the chances of finding a bunker and a missile silo were pretty remote. I figured he'd tire quickly and we'd sleep in the car until some cherry red pickup would find us and call the sheriff in to investigate. I was really looking forward to that encounter. Murphy would explain that the entrance to hell was in his county somewhere and ask directions. The sheriff would gladly ob oblige to guide us personally. I thought maybe I could convince him to sleep in the trunk. When I caught up with him, he was standing on the top of a bunker like the Jolly Green Giant, hands on his hips, hat staring blankly out of his jacket. The door was open. Now, people frequently die in abandoned missile silos in Nebraska. There can be 30 feet of standing water in some of them. It can break your fall if you slip on the corroded and broken ladders down into them. They are dark during the day. They smell bad. If Murphy Johnson wanted to go to hell, I figured nobody at this late date could stop him. I talked him out of the cat, which he replaced in his jacket with a tequila, and uh, let him go. If he had had a parachute, he would have jumped because it was quicker. He was ready for the unknown, as usual. He put on his World War II aviator shades with the amber lenses for luck. They were the same ones that were identified with him later, the famous amber shades. He claims to have gotten them from some hobo guru in a boxcar in the Himalayas, but actually, Marianne had given them to him in sympathy after one of his binges. They had belonged to her father. He disappeared into the inkwell opening and discovered the echo chamber there and did Elvis Presley all the way down, my way. The cat licked my nose. I turned the recorder on and sat on the bunker. He was doing all the parts, including the backup singers and the guitar solos. He had it on down. It's on the tape. All of a sudden, he was interrupted. And like I said, this is on the tape. Let me play it for you. The tape said, Shut up. Now, legend has it that he claims that it was the ghost of Charles Starkweather at the bottom of the missile silo, which most of the rock critics and fanatics claim was politically motivated, but, th but I think he was serious, personally. Not that, they, not that he met the ghost of Starkweather necessarily, but at that juncture in his life, he might as well have.
This is a automobile ride with Dan the man, the uh, minister at the wedding. The wind and ocean are blowing this wild duet at the mouth of the cave, and it's so loud, man, that it wipes out my ability to think. It becomes thought. Dan hits the horn, a long, surprised blast that scares the shit out of Jesse. Just like that, see? For a few seconds, nothing was going on for you except the horn. Understand? It was like that, only continuous. Jesse's heart plays bongos in his chest. Dan continues. Because of the echo, it was louder inside the cave, overwhelming. Remember, I can't think, judge, or analyze, just perceive. I'm pure awareness, man, a walking eyeball. I light a torch and move into the darkness. I'm in the middle of an ancient temple. There are a few columns left standing in a partial altar. Mostly there is rubble. I step over a fallen pier pillar and enter a large chamber. There's something ahead of me. It's of tremendous size. I move towards it, my torch in front of me. You're not going to hit the horn again, are you, asked Jesse. Dan shakes his head. I can make out a bicep in the darkness. It must be twice my height. Suddenly I can see the whole thing. It's a massive stone idol which is toppled backwards. It must have fallen on something because it's, because it's laying on an incline buried to the waist in sand. Part of the chest is covered. And part of the face is covered too. I move closer to the god's head, lifting my torch. The face on the idol is mine. Dan honks a horn again. Jesse jumps. Dan's roommate is a, an 85-year-old man by the name of Malcolm, who is uh, deeply into ritual magic and being weird, basically. Uh, they are being evicted from their home. This is a telephone call from Dan the Man to Jesse. The mortals who own these humble digs, however, are extremely interested to talking to him. He's been gone for three days. We don't know where he is. There are only four households left in the entire building, man, and they're getting very angry about the whole situation. They've turned the elevators off. For repairs, they say. Nobody in this building can take the steps. Even Malcolm needs to rest after a flight, and you know how strong he is. The scene's getting weirder all the time, you know? Try this. The renovations on the mall below are completed and open for business. The first two floors of apartments are done, Daddy. And above that are 17 floors of empty or nearly empty apartments. It's a maze. The, mar the apartments up there still have all the fixtures from the 20s and the 30s. It's completely modern and clean down there. Surreal. It was not unusual for Marianne to find undeveloped canisters of film around her apartment. This one, however, had been right out in the open on her kitchen counter in plain sight. The masking tape on it put it almost a year old. The kitchen was a foul and odious place where Marianne ventured in only to retrieve film from the refrigerator. It had a leprous sink and stove. It spoke of long neglect and lost knowledge of those who came before, the art of cooking and cleaning up. Marianne's fear of the latter had escalated with the craggy mountain of dishes in the sink. It was insurmountable. The thought of these dishes filled her with oppression and despair. Meanwhile, an ill odor was brewing and hanging like a mist over the terrain. Getting the film out of the refrigerator became an epic, but going through with this epic gave her courage. She began to get strength for her revulsion. Pride swelled her breasts, and one day, when Aurora was just beginning to lift her skirts on the horizon, she woke out of a dead sleep obsessed and charged in the kitchen to clean it. Her hand shot for the light chain, pulled it down like an engineer going for the whistle on a steam train, and snapped the light on. 
the film canister debuted in her consciousness at number one. She saw the film, the, uh, the dishes diminished in importance. Marianne developed and contract, contacted the film. There were nothing but birds on the film. A trip to the aviary she didn't even remember. The last shot was underexposed and hard to see. Marianne thought of the dishes and decided to work on it. it. Turned out to be a picture of Jesse, lying on the stage at Carlo's bar in a fetal position, one hand over his head, the other clutching the microphone to his chest. Normally, that is normally for the last few months, Jesse would slip nude under Marianne's memory and prop himself up on one elbow and whisper into her ear. This unexpected appearance of Jesse, however, was a popsicle goose, not because of the photograph, but because what the photograph delivered, a full-blown reality horror show, something that she had blocked out for quite a while. Now that she had developed the picture, she had to live it. Mary Ann seldom experienced things while they were going on, because she was always behind a camera. Events, even the worst of tragedies, would sequence by and stills in front of her. She seldom would experience anything until she was in the dark room. She would witness whole concerts that way, bopping to the beat under the enlarger weeks later. It was a good show, she'd tell people enthusiastically. People would assume that she was talking about one show when it was another. Jesse was just the opposite. He was only slightly psychic. A split second would press itself into his brain, a split second before a slanting impression would press itself into him. He would drop from ordinary awareness like a phonograph needle into the loose grooves at the beginning of a record. There would be contact, silence, then music. These interludes were seldom earth-shaking. It wasn't time to deja vu, really. He would just become more aware of the moment as it was happening. A squirrel in a tree, the way pain would pass on the face of a stranger on a bus. The image would stretch in minute detail in his mind, and his ability to give these images over to other people made him an artist, and that was only the beginning of his problems. This particular photograph grabbed Mary Ann by the throat and invited her in for tea. She did what it asked immediately. Seconds later, she of course would realize that the photograph was just a piece of silvered paper with many dots, that it had no threats really, unless someone would ball it up and force it down her throat or wrap a lead paperweight in it before striking her on the head with it. At the moment, however, with the in-breath, she was back to the night with Jesse. She had a late assignment that night and was just getting back to the dark room that her uncle Carlo had built for her in the back of the bar off the dressing room behind the stage, and Jesse was performing. A fact, had she been thinking, she would have known and gone someplace else to work on the film. He was free associating and tinkering with some things that he probably shouldn't have been tinkering with. When he did stream of conscious, it made her crazy. Whether it was over coffee or in bed or a part of his act, he called abstracting into insanity. What happened was that people would yell out topics and he'd respond with jazz scat poetic abstraction. He was watching his hope mature daily in that. Jesse's concept of erotica, incidentally, was more Walt Disney than Walt Lemon. His favorite bit of erotica was Peter Pan in a short passage from Tom Sawyer where a hesitant Becky whispers, I love you, in Tom's ear. So he would get into these mildly erotic raps and people would leave and that would be the end of the show. Mary Ann didn't particularly like this, so she didn't go. On this particular night, someone in the audience yelled, Ruth, at him during the free abstraction part of the show. At first it sounded like the bark of a dog, but it repeated several times in quick succession. Then more distinctly it said, tell us about Ruth. Jesse could have reacted in quite a few ways. What happened was he had a quizzical smile on his face, and suddenly he began to collapse and curl into a ro uh, curl into a rose budding in reverse in the spotlight. Jesse did not move. The sold-out attention of the room was pinging like pins dropped on the silence. 
waiting for the gag to break the bladder of concern, concentrating in that room. There was nothing for what seemed like an eternity. Every electron in Mary Ann's body was lined up in a neon mambo line, mambo line, and was kicking the message, get him off the stage. But she didn't. Instead, she stamped mechanically the camera, cocked and focused her camera, and shot Jesse curled on the stage with the dusty gloria of the spotlight pulling around him. With nervous laughter subsiding, every second he lay there, the tension became unbearable. Carlo moved from behind the bar towards the stage. Jesse's voice intoned into the microphone in an eerie calm. I'm fine, really. I'd just like to be left alone. Carlo had the lights out, and they carried Jesse off the stage. What'd you do that for? asked Jesse later. You know I you know what I do. That's called tantric comedy. I was into it. It had been a horrible experience. At once both gripping fear for those the gripping fear of losing those around you and the fear of losing yourself with it. It was horrible. That's why it was perfect. I think I'm going to stop with that. Thanks very much for coming.